Pumoke. Pumoke is a cheeky little goblin, and he was one of me and my brother's uh, most favorite cartoon characters. He's very famous in the 80s and 90s in Germany and Austria. And finally, he or his name became symbol, synonym for our family for the ethics of eating meat. So my great-grandfather was a miller, so he milled grain for animals and people around our town. And when my parents got married, they decided to settle there. It's like right out, outside of town, next to a river. And because they saw it as a hobby and because they loved eating good beef, they decided to get a herd of cows. So that's me with our first herd. You see, super proud, super excited about having these cows around our house. And that's actually my brother and our very first calf, so the very first baby we got in our herd. And we called him Pumoku, of course. So that's Pumoku too. And my parents will tell you that Pumoku and his brothers and sisters, they were having the greatest of lives. They were grazing freely with zero stress on green meadows all of their lives until the certain day came and my dad got a rifle and with one bang, this was pumukri too. So would you eat pumukri? So you can see that for me and my brother, seeing pumukri on, on the plate in front of us was was quite a heavy moment in, in our lives and it became quite a story for, for our family. So the experiences I had as a child didn't make me vegan, neither vegetarian, but they did, they did ingrain in me the deep connection to the food that I have on my plate. And later on, it made me wonder about the food system as a whole, especially when I came here to Hong Kong to work as an industrial designer on the dried seafood street. I mean, really, where does all this come from? I actually still don't know. Like the, the milk in the, in the supermarket, the, all, all the stuff you can find on the, on the seafood market, it amazes me still every single day. And I looked deeper into the food system when I got here and I found out that it is neither sustainable nor healthy. We use more than a third of croplands worldwide only to feed animals. More than 80% of antibiotics are going into livestock production. Antimicrobial resistance is one of the biggest health issues worldwide, and it comes from traces of antibiotics in our meat. So this system really, really makes us sick uh, and creates a lot of problems for the planet. This is a lake of manure and waste and blood. So as a consumer, you really don't have a lot of choice. In the supermarket, you can go for the white eggs or the brown eggs, the large ones or the small ones, the ones that come from Thailand or maybe Australia, maybe New Zealand, but do you really know how that chicken lived? And that's not important because I care so much about the idol, the idol fantasy of this, of this chicken roaming around and being happy, but because it directly influences your health through hormones, through medicines, pharmaceuticals that are in the egg. So when I found out about all this, I got really lost. I got really confused about, you know, what, what can you do as an individual to eat healthy food, to know where your food comes from, to know how it's grown. How can I empower myself and others to live a healthy life and make, make conscious choices? From very big animals in the beginning of my life, I came to research about the very small ones, insects. Insects are the largest biomass on the planet. And today, my dish would look somewhat like this. <laughs> no meat, but insects. <laughs> so take this dish, for example. Like, say there's about 500 grams of insects in there. Now, compared to the same amount of beef, we could save only with this dish 
4,500 bottles, liters of water, and 4.5 hectares of land. That's more than 1,000 Hong Kong apartments. <laughs> and that's, of course, specific to the city as well. They're in fact, they can be, in fact, bred on so little spaces that they can be bred in your own home. Now, that's the world's first desktop farm, desktop, desktop hive, to grow insects as a food source in your home. I, I founded a startup company, and we, we shipped this to more than 350 customers worldwide, and this is a photo of a customer in Sweden, his apartment, his food production unit. So these customers, they grow their insects in our hives on kitchen scraps. They feed them and they harvest protein-rich, nutrient-rich, healthy food from it. Now, why do they do it? Insects combine really the best of meat and plant-based proteins, not only proteins, a lot of nutrients, vitamin B5, vitamin B12, fiber. While they take less land, less water, less resources, less feed than beef or any other type of livestock. And they're actually in your food already. Every single one of you eats about 500 grams of insects every year. And no, it's not while you're sleeping or while you're taking the bike. It's in your everyday food. There's an average of one larvae per glass of orange juice. You have it in frozen food, in your soup, and they're in chocolate too. And I mean, we're in Asia here. We know insects from Chinese medicine. We know it as a food source in Southeast Asia. It's eaten all around the world and in many parts of Asia too. And when I look at the snack foods that you see around in Hong Kong, it reminds me a lot actually of our insects and what they look like after they're dried and fried and spiced up. And even in the West, you know, we're not too far away from accepting a new kind of food. Potatoes, sushi, lobster, these are all foods that have been considered gross, disgusting, or weird at some moment in time. But all they had was a thorough rebranding. Potatoes were considered the food of the poor, Sushi was the workers' food for, for people in Japan. And, and lobster was the cockroach of the ocean. So really, we just need to brand it the right way in order to get insects on our plates. But then, globally speaking, we need to really think about two major methods in order to make it a safe, nutritious, and widely available food source internationally. The first step is breeding them efficiently. And now that has been my job from the very beginning. So that was the very first larvae I ever bred. And I started to design a habitat um, around, uh, around the life cycle. Every single little detail of the device was designed so that they could grow happily and healthily. Tiny holes to lay their eggs, surfaces to crawl up on and to slide down on. Um, little things really that make it possible to combine the best from a biological standpoint for the insects to grow them efficiently, but then at the same time to give people the opportunity to not get in touch with them too much, to really have it as a, you know, a smooth, a simple and nice process. So these were the prototypes along the way from the very first one to the last one before we started manufacturing. But then, of course, this is, this is just a tool. Um, the second step is really about getting people to eat them. So how do we do that? <laughs> um, when I first came out with my first prototype, I started to do a trip around the world because a lot of people had given me a lot of advice how to make something out of this idea. I was traveling in the United States. I made a granola. I called it Grobnola. It traveled the world with a, with, with a man who, who wrote a book about uh, recipes about uh, insects. I went to Hawaii to grow fly larvae there on fruit pulp. 
we fed it to chicken in order to create a local egg again. Hawaii is very much similar to Hong Kong in that most of the food there is imported. They have very limited ways of, of creating, of producing their own food and farming there. I went to Africa. I grew insects there. I built a pilot plant there. And uh, people had always told me, you know, that, oh, why don't you go to Africa? People, people eat insects there, right? <laughs> so I actually did go there because I wanted to look for myself. And actually, it's much more, much more complex than that. People would also say, oh, of course you're in Asia because people eat insects there, right? <laughs> and then when I talk to people here in Hong Kong, they say, oh, of course you sell this in Europe. They're more open-minded about it there, right? <laughs> Yeah, see, that's why I had to do all these trips to find out the truth about all this. <laughs> so the last project before I came back to Hong Kong was in Malaysia. Um, I set up a pilot facility there, breeding insects on different substrates. And then I came back to Hong Kong with one conclusion. Not a single invention of mine or of other people are going to change the food system grinding up insects and putting it into, into foods is not going to change the food system. The only thing that can really change the system in a positive way is the people. The people who grow the food, the people who cook the food, the chefs who come up with new recipes about it, the people who buy it, who make a, who make a conscious choice, hopefully, in the supermarket, and who bring it home and cook it for their loved ones. And this is exactly what our customers are doing. They get our hives, and they're starting these little food revolutions literally out of their kitchens in China, in Europe, in the US. <laughs> and the coolest thing is they don't only you know, grow their own insects, get to know their food, get to know where it comes from, how it's grown. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> but they, they also actively support each other. We have a community, um, and they, they will come up with new ways of, of doing things, things that we couldn't even think about. They found ways to upgrade our hardware, to track the data from it. Some of them even grow our insects on plastics. They grow them on styrofoam because recent uh, research suggests that they can digest it safely. So it's pretty amazing. They create new recipes, they share it, and while they are building this movement, while they are you know, really educating the people in their surroundings that this is a safe and healthy food source, we're working with farmers, taking the next step to really bring it on the plates of people as a safe, and sustainable and readily available food source worldwide. So I invite all of you to join this movement to, to take farming, to take cooking, to take conscious choices really into your own hands. And maybe next time when you have a piece of meat or a dish of wonderful food in front of you, you might want to think of pumukri and that it's really up to you to co-create a healthy planet. Thank you.